Hi everyone, my name is Pluny Pennings. I'm a professor at San Francisco State University. I am making this video together with two colleagues, Brandon Okbunu from Brown University and Sanai Yedbarek from UC Berkeley. We want to tell you about the outbreak of the new coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2, that underlies COVID-19. We're going to talk about how contagious this virus is, how many people ultimately may get infected, and what we can do to flatten the curve. Flattening the curve means slowing down the epidemic to prevent as many deaths and hospitalizations as possible. I want to start with a disclaimer. We are not COVID-19 or SARS-CoV-2 experts, and we're not medical doctors. But we do work on viruses and infectious disease, and we hope that this video can help you understand the news better. There are two characteristics of an epidemic that tell us how afraid we should be. One of them is how contagious it is. The other is how virulent it is. That is, how likely is it to cause harm or death in someone infected? These are not the only important features of an epidemic, but they are usually the places that we start when describing one. The contagiousness is often summarized by a number called the basic reproduction number. We will discuss this later. But how dangerous a disease is for people infected is often summarized by a number called the case fatality rate, or CFR. The case fatality rate is a ratio of sorts, the number of people who die of a disease divided by the number of people who have it. In the case of the novel coronavirus, we're talking about the fraction of people infected with the virus who have died. One notable thing about the case fatality rate is that it is very easy to miscalculate. For example, early in an epidemic, the cases that stand out are the worst ones, people that die or people who suffer from serious disease. The problem with this is that in the case of COVID-19, many people have mild symptoms. For example, if 500 people display symptoms of a disease and 10 of them die, you would determine a case fatality rate of 2%. But what if 500 more people actually were infected, but had symptoms that were so mild that they went undiagnosed? In this situation, the more accurate case fatality rate would be 1%. This is a constant challenge for the public health sector to report on the latest and most realistic measures while recognizing that these estimates can change. One interesting feature of this outbreak is how the case fatality rate varies across different subpopulations. For example, the case fatality rate appears relatively high among people over the age of 70. Children under the age of 10, alternatively, appear relatively unaffected. In addition, the disease seems to really impact people with prior health conditions. The worry here is that people may not take this virus seriously because it mostly affects older folks, as in, well, they're sick and old and are going to die of something anyway. This is a really unfortunate view. If viral outbreaks should teach us anything, it's that we're all in this together. I mean, the vast majority of people know someone who may be seriously affected. And all of these case fatality rates are averages. At the end of the day, who knows how a given individual will be affected. Now that we have discussed the case fatality rate, Let's move on to talking about the famous and mysterious metric called the basic reproduction number. But before we begin, let's imagine what it takes for an epidemic to spread in a population. First, a susceptible individual gets infected by a virus. Once an individual is infected, it needs at least one other person for the virus to spread in the population. Once individuals infect more than one individual, then the number of infections will increase exponentially, as happens during an epidemic. This is referred to as the basic reproduction number, also known as R0. At the start of an epidemic, a single infected individual will infect R0 more individuals, after which the newly infected individuals 
will also in fact are not more individuals until the epidemic reaches a peak and slows down. So how do scientists actually calculate the r naught? There are different ways to calculate r naught. One way is quite intuitive. The number of people that someone infects will depend on the number of days they're infectious, the number of susceptible people that they meet, and the chance that a meeting leads to an infection. Therefore, washing hands and avoiding crowds reduces r naught. We can slow the epidemic by keeping r naught below 1 so that infected individuals are generating less infections. The course of an epidemic depends on a number of key epidemiological factors, some of which scientists are still learning about. First, there may be considerable presymptomatic infectiousness. This makes early surveillance and control of this epidemic crucial, because transmission can potentially take place before the onset of symptoms. Asymptomatic cases are another uncertainty. Estimates suggest that 80% of COVID-19 cases are mild or asymptomatic, implying that symptom-based control is not enough. Lastly, the length of the infectious period for COVID-19 remains an uncertainty. For instance, influenza A has a relatively short infectious period, but in the case of COVID-19, it may last up to 10 days or longer. If we know the r naught, then we should know a lot about how a disease is spread, right? I mean, the r naught is super important because it describes the potential for how fast an epidemic can grow. But like we mentioned earlier, it describes the average number of secondary infections in scenarios where no one has previously had the disease. As you can imagine, in many situations, some individuals have already had the disease, and so the r naught isn't so predictive. It is not set in stone, and many features of how an outbreak plays out will influence these numbers, and especially the r naught. We must be mindful of this, and this explains why you see varying r naught values in so many different settings. This continues to be an area of inquiry. We're always curious as to why it, the disease appears more contagious in some settings than others. Well, I hope you've understood that R0 influences how fast the epidemic spreads, but also that our behavior influences R0. Having many people in the same room often will increase R0, but everyone staying home more often and washing their hands very regularly, that will reduce R0. That's why cities are canceling events. They want to slow down the spread of this virus. Well, some of you may think, does slowing down even help anyone? Aren't we all going to get infected anyways? Well, slowing down can make a big difference, especially on the number of people who get the infection at the same time. If too many people get infected at the same time, it will simply overwhelm our hospitals. Imagine that 1% of the Americans were infected at the same time. That's 3.3 million people. Then, imagine that 1% of those people need a bed in an ICU. That's 33,000 people. Well, that's more than one third of all ICU beds in the country. And we really need these intensive care units for the regular patients. We don't have that space. So we need to slow the epidemic so that we have enough, enough hospital beds, doctors and nurses to take care of everyone. Epidemiologists expect that ultimately 20 to 60% of us will get the coronavirus. So my 1% example is really quite conservative. But if we reduce r naught by washing our hands and canceling events, we can flatten the curve. And history shows that this is really possible. During the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic, some cities were much faster with canceling events and closing their schools. And that saved a lot of lives. This image shows the number of people who died in the 1918 Spanish flu epidemic in Philadelphia and St. Louis. Philadelphia waited two weeks before they canceled events, whereas St. Louis acted within two days. You can see that the curve for St. Louis is much flatter and the total number of people who died was smaller in St. Louis. So here's a message from us. 
three researchers who use math to study biology. To the governors, the mayors, the ministers, and the presidents of this world, please do your part to reduce R0 to flatten this curve. Thank you for watching and let us know if you have any questions.